Hi, today we are in Munich at Flixbus Office with Jochen. Jochen, who are you and what do you do? Hi, um, welcome here. Um, I'm Jochen, one of the founders of Flixbus. Um, I'm here responsible for everything we do on marketing, sales and the finance part. Um, I've been doing well, something completely different to the bus industry before, classical management consulting. Did start a PhD thesis, which I had to well, sort of break up. Um, to start the bus business since um, the market was um, deregulated just last year and this was just the opportunity for us to start the business. When did you have this uh, idea of starting such a bu uh, bus mm. uh, business? We initially thought about it quite some time ago. So it started 2009 where the, the last government actually had it written down in their coalition contract. So they said we're going to regular deregulate the market and we were like oh that sounds interesting how often does that happen actually that markets still get deregulated and then we thought about it in the first place saying oh there's probably going to be Deutsche Bahn coming and they're going to just fill up the market and there's no chance to actually develop a new business and then well maybe a year or one and a half year later Deutsche Bahn said oh the market is not going to be attractive it's not profitable we're not going to do it and we were like oh maybe it's still interesting and we we got back to the idea and started discussing business models again and in the end it turns out it's the combination of classical online marketing e-commerce business so we're selling tickets online and something that is very real so buses is pretty real as real as, as it can get and um, a bus industry and, and company owners that we work with that are very well weird in a way but cool to work with and that combination is is unique for us and then again in a market that just recently got deregulated was that once in a lifetime opportunity we just had to take you, you started this company while you were studying for phd yeah. what was the final trigger point that made you switch from being a student mm -hmm. to uh, becoming an entrepreneur we actually that phase took quite some time to go from having a, a well well-paid job the phd part finalizing the thesis to saying, okay, I have to leave all this behind and be an entrepreneur. But in the end, we were like, okay, this is that once in a lifetime chance. And if we're not going to do it, we're probably going to be pretty sad if we don't do it. And we're always going to always gonna have um, the idea or, or the, um, we, we, we think we missed out on something. So we just had to do it at some point. Okay. Let's talk about the business model of Flixbus. Mm. So can you tell us briefly how it works? Mm. Basically, it's pretty comparable to what franchises do. So the McDonald's is out there. Um, we do everything that goes with the product. So we give, we do the scheduling, the network planning, we do the bus branding, we do all the marketing communications, we do all, everything that goes with sales, IT, ticketing, etc. And we do all the service towards the customer. So once a customer calls in, he's going to reach colleagues of us. Um, once he writes an email, he reaches us and we do the operations, so the bus driving part pretty much together with um, local partners. Mm -hmm. So it's medium sized private companies throughout Germany. We work with over 50 companies um, across the country and um, they do the operations for us. So they will bring in the assets, they bring in the drivers, they brand the buses for us and they sort of deliver the product in the way we want them to deliver it. And um, on top of that, we have sort of like a revenue share model. So once a line goes very well, they're going to be very profitable. Once it's not going so well, we're going to share the risk of utilization with them. And that sort of leaves us with a great incentive to do good marketing, to do good sales, to have our effort focused on that part mm -hmm. and leaves them with an incentive to deliver good quality, clean buses, friendly drivers, good quality service. And that's sort of like the business model. When you started with this business model, did you focus on specific routes? Um, mm. I don't know, like uh, Munich to, to Berlin or mm. something like this? Mm. Well, our approach was we have to provide a nationwide network. So in whatever bigger city you're looking for a connection to another city, you'll have to find some offer on our website. So that was the initial idea. And, and then at the beginning we thought, okay, we can start with the whole network all at once, but obviously that usually doesn't work. Yeah. So we had to be a little pragmatic at the beginning. We, we focused on the bigger routes, so we've been connecting bigger cities, so the Munich, Hamburg, Berlin, Frankfurt, Cologne, etc. And um, then sort of developed the network over time. And we started with only 10 buses. Meanwhile, we're running over 150 buses throughout uh, Germany every day. Also connecting cities in other countries across the borders. 
And um, yeah, as I said, you've got to be pragmatic at some point. So we just had to start and get, get going. And in the end, it turns out there's no chance you can start with the whole network at once, but you have to sort of develop the processes over time and sort of get into what the business model in all detail looks like. How did you acquire the, the first operator, the first bus operator? Mm. It's pretty much like investors for us. Um, it, it's been a long, long time for us to sort of visit them. We've been traveling throughout Germany to visit bus companies, talk to them, say, okay, look, this is the market. It's going to develop. It's going to be fast and it's going to be really big and it's going to be attractive for all of us. Um, we're going to concentrate on what we do best, marketing, sales. You're going to do the operations. Don't you want to work with us? And it's usually been really like an investor pitch. You've got to imagine it's usually family-owned businesses. The father has sort of built up the country, uh, the, the company 50, 60 years ago. Son took it over. And now he's like in, in the position to, okay, I want to do something with the company. There's, well, rather no growth in their core businesses. So they're doing travel, they're doing um, local public transportation, and there's no growth in that. So they also have the chance to have a growth business developing. And, um, and then it's really an investor pitch. You've got to persuade them to invest hundreds of thousands of euros, in parts millions of euros, in the buses and the drivers and the operational cost. And um, that takes a lot of discussion, a lot of arguments, a lot of persuasion to actually bring them to that point. So basically your pitch was like this, hey guys, you, are, you have your local business mm -hmm. uh, with the lo local buses, we yeah. can bring you national, yeah. but in order for, for you, uh, you to become national, you will need to invest in some buses. It, with our branding exactly obviously. exactly we, we said look you're very good at operations yeah. we're good at marketing and sales let's bring that together and let's build that big brand throughout uh, germany we're going to bring you together with different partners across the country and we're going to build what we do now and flix plus providing over 1,000 connections throughout germany mm -hmm. and um in the end it appealed to enough partners to actually start the business so And uh, how much traction did you need in order to, uh, f uh, let's say, fill up the buses sufficiently? Mm. Um, I mean, at the beginning, there was a lot of PR and, and media around it. So that obviously helped us uh, and helped the market in total to sort of get, come to the awareness of the people. And at the beginning, again, it's, it's pretty, pretty common. It's been early adopters like younger people, students who tried it out. And then you get word of mouth and, and they spread the word and usually... Um, people are very satisfied with our service. It's, it's really low price. You can go Munich, Berlin for like 15 euros if you book early. So you, there's no cheaper way to get there. Um, and then people are usually surprised how comfortable the buses are today. Um, I mean, if you think about buses, you usually have in mind, okay, there's my granny going to somewhere over the weekend and it's like old fashioned, but we also changed the image of going by bus. And it's, it's free Wi-Fi on board. It's really comfortable. Usually the drivers quite friendly and it's quite nice service and that changed the whole picture and image on buses and that still helps us to get traction on the whole thing. And this is also related to uh, that, the, that the local operators bought new buses which have an economical yeah. uh, advantage over all the old buses. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean they're, they're really operating our bus fleet I think on average is like one and a half years old or so mm -hmm. at the most. They usually have brand new buses bought for us um, in our specifications so we need the lag space we define lag space you need to have in there there's obviously there's toilets there's wi-fi etc and um, that again leaves you also with an operational cost advantage because they're much more efficient in long distance operations than older buses yeah. and what are the main key performance indicators that you're trying to manage mm -hmm. Well, obviously, obviously, from a marketing and sales perspective, it's the classical ones. It's uh, CPO, it's customer acquisition cost, it's overall marketing budget what we spend there, it's um, service cost per ticket, like these kind of KPIs, uh, and we measure traffic, conversion, etc. Um, operationally, we look into how do we get um, line operations as cost effective as possible, and that has to do a lot with geography. So where is the bus partner sitting? Because you have certain limitations on bus driver availability how long are they actually allowed to drive a bus and when do they have to change and that goes along with really complex network planning so we have pretty well let's call them nerdy mathem mathematics guys doing the network planning and, and that's pretty complex meanwhile and we really focus on cost efficiency there so you look into what how much does it cost to operate the bus between munich and berlin how do we optimize that and there's a lot, lot of kpis in there mm -hmm. we usually measure that in euros per kilometer and that's what we optimize on mm -hmm. and then again 
prices are very important for us. So we look into what do we earn per kilometer per ticket. And that's kind of like the, the core KPIs that we look for. Okay. Let's uh, talk about the corporate strategy. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, w one thing I would be very interested in uh, how you would try to generate a competitive advantage mm -hmm. and whether it's possible to um, make this business profitable on a low scale or whether you really need a high scale. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting because um, in the market at the moment we're playing against large corporations. So we're playing against Deutsche Bahn, against ADAC and POST and, and some other corporates as well. Um, from a startup perspective, our advantage is to do good marketing and to be very efficient in what we do on online and performance marketing. So that's kind of like the competitive advantage that we have as a startup. And also that we, we are very flexible with a partner. So we change routes every day, every week. We sort of flexible to, to adjust what we do in our offer. And um, on the other part, you need a certain scale to be able to do that profitably. And, um, Especially the, the, the part that we do is so with the marketing and sales has a lot of synergies to the size you do in, in the business. And so that leaves us with a certain well, growth demand that we have and we're going to grow the business um, quite aggressively. We're going to expand our offer um, but till the end of the year, we're going to still double it again. And um, This also brings us to the point where we say, okay, is Germany going to be enough? Uh, and Germany is the biggest mobility market in Germany, in, in Europe, um, but we still think that also in other markets, there's no business model that actually compares to what we do and, and the way we do it, coming from that online e-commerce part and bringing that to a transportation company, mm -hmm. which are two, well, very, actually very far away parts of the story. And um, so we, we're going to also do that in other countries. We're going to bring Flixbus at, at the beginning to other cities that are closer to Germany, so yeah. we're going to connect Prague, we're going to connect Vienna, Amsterdam, Paris, etc. And then we're going to bring the whole model also to other countries. Makes sense. And um, again, that leaves you with a scale advantage on what you do on the overhead part. So marketing, sales, IT, etc. And um, also the, on the product side, if you look into other countries, there are some bus services on okay quality, but in the most countries it's pretty shabby. So we think we can bring a better product to the people there too. Okay. That brings us perfectly to the market development. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, what I would be very interested in is um, how are the different markets close to Germany mm. um, related to the bus uh, or transportation in general? Mm. I mean, Germany has been a, a train market ever since. Um, and since the law protected Deutsche Bahn from competition, it's just been that way. So just now that it opened up, the market is really rapidly developing and it's, it's really f uh, growing fast. But also in other countries, you the market structure is is really well differentiated. If you look to France, for example, they have a situation that is comparable to Germany about one or two years before deregulation. So you're still not allowed to offer intercity bus trips. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see where that goes. Might be very interesting because we have a similar situation with the local train companies there. Um, Spain, for example, there is a bus network. There's large players, but they're more like corporates, slow, conservative. Might be interesting too. Um, if you look into Italy, it's very fragmented. You have a lot of small players that um, provide individual lines. There's no well, overall branding marketing. Um, a different market situation, but also interesting. And then if you look into Eastern Europe, there's loads of smaller providers too. Like the buses, that one mean of transportation there. They usually don't have very good train networks. Um, so the, the bus market itself is, is very mature. The way that people buy the product is not very mature at all. Uh, and that's so, where you come into play. And that's right? where we might come into play. So okay. um, there's different situations in, in all the countries and, and we're thinking about what is our go-to-market strategy in these individual countries and um, in what sort of also time frame we're going to do it. Um, and we're in the middle of that discussion and we're going to well, probably look into next year um, to really make that expansion step towards other countries. And in Europe, which market is uh, the most developed? Because when I was mm -hmm. in the UK, I was uh, yeah. uh, traveling by bus from city to city yeah. and it was quite cheap. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, what, how, how, is big the is the how, how big is the market in the UK? So how much sales are all the uh, companies mm -hmm. in bus transportation doing? Yeah. UK is probably the most developed market if you look into bus services. Um, there's National Express and Stagecoach, the two big players, and their um, total market value should be around 350 to 400 million. Um, 
Germany is going to be like three times that size at least. Wow. And um, driven by what? Why, why is the size in Germany uh, supposed to be much bigger? Because the structure is different. If you look into um, other countries, um, France is very Paris-centric, UK is pretty London-centric. They don't travel a lot. <laughs> Lon Londoners don't travel too much around the country, true. And um, in Germany it's different. You have a lot of centers. There's Munich, there's Berlin, there's, there's Hamburg, um, Frankfurt, Cologne, and there's all this area in, in um, the Ruhrpott, what we call it. Yeah. So there's, there's big cities, big centers, and people are traveling a lot more. So if you look into overall traffic volume and compare that to other countries, you can easily project how big the market is going to be. If you just take the share of the bus in other countries, project that to Germany, you'd easily come to a market volume over a billion euros. Wow. So. Next thing would, I would be very interested in is uh, what would be your forecast for the market development mm. in countries like Italy or Germany in mm. terms of uh, fragmentation, mm. so whether there might be some consolidation case, etc. Mm. And the, the second thing, would, what would be your forecast for uh, countries like France where they are currently regulated, mm. whether they will deregulate someone as well? Mm. I mean, it's the, in, in, if I look at Germany, there is going to be a consolidation phase. Um, there won't be... 10, 15 players um, around because it just doesn't make sense. As I said, you need a certain level of scale to actually be able to provide a good service. And um, so there's, we, we're going to be seeing consolidation here. Uh, timing wise, it's really difficult to say when it's going to happen. And we're sure we're going to play a very active part in that. Um, <laughs> in other countries, there's either already has been consolidation. So Spain is one, maybe two players dominating the market, UK the same. Um, in Italy, we'll see where that goes. Uh, there's, at the moment, there's a lot of players and um, also, especially with the online and the marketing part, there might be consolidation over the next years too. And then we see where, where this is going. And um, yeah, for, for us, we think that in our business model, we, we are one of the driving forces also for market development. So the demand is just there and the, the demand is, is growing. People will always look for cheap mobility. Um, and it's just a question of, of how you approach that. And for the regulation in France, mm. what would be a forecast? Difficult to say. There's, it's always difficult to look into politicians too deep. And, and we just, we're, we're looking at the market, we're, we're closely following what's happening. And there might be a comparable development to what's happened in Germany. And, and it's not given that large transport companies are going to take the market. And it's the same in Germany. People were surprised and Deutsche Bahn still is very surprised how fast the market developed. And why shouldn't that happen in the same way in, in France? I totally understand why Deutsche Bahn is not moving very ag uh, ag mm. aggressively into this market because they don't want to cannibalize their core business. That's what they still say, but that's, that was the same speech that um, airlines gave 15 years ago. Why should we go into low-cost airlines? And, and now Lufthansa is working with the German wings together and you see that in, in other countries too. And Ryanair is the most profitable airline in the world. So they're underestimating the market still and we'll see how that develops over time. Jochen, we always try to give our readers some kind of advice um, mm. on how they become better entrepreneurs. Mm. And uh, I would be interested in your advice to first-time entrepreneurs. Mm. If I look into what we learn over time, and there's, there's maybe, there's probably two things that are most important. One is, we've had a lot of senior advisors. We had business angels in the beginning, and, and we usually thought, Okay, they, they're going to give you some advice and we, we thought, okay, we know it better anyways. Why, well, nice to have his, his opinion, but we know it better. And in the end, it turns out they were always right. <laughs> so the, if, my advice would be to really sort of listen to what they're saying. If you have senior guys that you trust, and we do trust them because they're one of our first business angels, we're really cool guy, we really trust him, we should have will listen in the first place and not make the same mistakes over and over again. So if you have senior advice, just listen to these guys and, and follow. Uh, I have very, uh, one very good point because this is one topic when people ask me about this, I will always tell them you have two conditions that you need to test. First condition is, is the other guy uh, being able to know it better than you? And second thing is, is he, uh, does he want the best for you and wants to help you? And if both conditions, and only if both conditions are positive, then listen and follow this advice, please. Absolutely true. I mean, there, there are some mistakes you just have to make yourself to get the learning out of it. And we're doing it every day. We're, we're really, we're living trial and error. We're trying, especially also on the marketing side, we're trying out new things, measure if it works. If it doesn't, we just throw it away. If it works, we just continue doing it and scale it up. 
So just trial and error is very important. But in the end, as you're saying, you, there's no point in not listening to senior guys if they're um, if you trust them and if they're in your favor. So why do, why don't you why shouldn't you do that? And the other part is. Um, as I, as I said in the beginning, um, at some point you just have to be pragmatic and just go and do it. There's always going to be difficulties and you never know if it's going to work out or not, but at, at some point you just have to go and do it. And um, we just, we came to hate that guy called Murphy, if you know Murphy's Law. <laughs> and we do, we do a transportation company, that's what we didn't, we didn't estimate in that dimension at the beginning and, and we really, we're like when we do processes today, we were like, okay, if this comes and that and that, this is not very likely that this happens and that, and then the process should be like that. And we're like, hey, it's going to be exactly like that. The most unlikely event is still going to happen with us because just the pure number of passengers we're transporting, everything is going to happen. And so we have to adjust our processes to that point. But still, you've got to be pragmatic at some point. You just got to start and just go and do it and then improve over time. And that's pretty much our. Well, one of the most important learn learnings we took. And uh, I think one other learning was very interesting because you convinced local operators to mm. basically invest in your business. Yeah. Not really on, on your balance sheet, but uh, at, at yeah. least uh, they put some money on the, mm. uh, on the floor. And uh, I would, uh, um, what advice can you give founders for pitching or acquiring this kind of partners? Mm. It's, it's, very, it's very difficult. You just you need a certain, I think, seniority level. You need to talk to them on, on eye level. That's very important, I think. And and you need to to be fair with them. If they feel you're gonna you're gonna drag them over the table or try to sort of cheat on them or something, they're not gonna work with you. So you need to develop a really fair model that gives um, risk and chance to both parties in a fair and balanced way. And that's that's really key. And and we, I mean, obviously there's some sort of information asymmetry between us and the operators. We have much more transparency on how the business goes, how the numbers are, etc. But in the end, you still got to find a fair and balanced way to work with them. And that's, that's really key. If the other party has, has an impression, and it's usually it's on a personal basis, they got to have the impression, okay, these guys treat me well and, and treat me in a fair way, yeah. then there's a high chance they're going to work with you. Jochen, thank you very much. Most welcome.